I'm so thrilled, as always, to welcome Spencer Clavin to the show. As I said, we're probably on our like eighth or month, our eighth or ninth, excuse me, thinker of the month series. Spencer Clavin is a features editor of The American Mind, an associate editor of the Claremont Review of Books, the host of the Young Heretics podcast, and he's also the author of How to Save the West, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. As if that is not enough, he also, I don't know how he has time to do any of this, he's also the co-author of a substack with his father, but no relation, Andrew Clavin. Their substack is called The New Jerusalem. And Spencer has a new book coming out in August, which you can pre-order. I have, of course, pre-ordered it. It is called Light of the Mind, Light of the World, How New Science is Illuminating Ancient Truths About God. And you know, I mentioned The New Jerusalem substack. And in particular, if I may, I would like to highlight a recent article that Spencer wrote called Eloquent Savages. It is so spot on. And he discusses the disorientation, as he put it, that many Americans feel in the face of not understanding or not confronting fundamental, what he calls cosmic questions about our existence. Spencer also talks about this in his book, How to Save the West, that we are encountering this crisis of meaning. And I'm so excited today to talk about Aristotle because although I don't know very much about him, I do know that he is one of those figures who can help illuminate some of those cosmic quagmires or questions that all of us face and need to face in order to be happy, healthy, functioning individuals. So let's dive in. Spencer, welcome back to Timeless. Thanks for being here. I got exhausted just hearing about those. I don't know who's up to doing those things, but thank you. Yes, I do wonder how you have time in the day to to accomplish all of that. Sean, would you mind turning Spencer up just a little bit for me? Oh, he can't. It's okay. I can hashtag lean in if that would be helpful. Get a little closer. Spencer, have you heard of Cliff Clavin? Sean wants to know. I, I sure have. As you may imagine, growing up, I heard once or twice about Old Cliff. But he spells his name differently. It's got a C. Oh, yes. And it's uh, a no. Clavin. Is with, your Clavin is with a K. Wow. Okay. I have a lot of references that I need to <laughs> to learn because I did not, uh, I had never heard of him. Whippersnapper. Yes. We yes. have to initiate you into the mysteries. Well, I will learn about that reference after the show, but now I'm really excited to learn about Aristotle. And as I indicated at the beginning of the episode, usually I can sustain a conversation with you about the various thinkers that we've discussed because I've I read them myself. We've discussed Karl Marx, Frederick Nietzsche, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Jesus Christ, just to to name a few. And, and I have read... Um, a lot about about all of those those individuals, and of course, I've I've read what they've written. Aristotle, I will admit, is a little different. I am not well versed in Aristotelian writing at all, so this is going to be very rudimentary. And as I said, I I think that that a lot of people can relate to me. I don't know how many people have combed through the writings of Aristotle. <laughs> so, let's just start off. Can you just give us a background on Aristotle? When did he live? Where did he live? And what what is his uh, what was his upbringing like? His background? Absolutely. And you're not alone. You're right. Even people who like me study the ancient world pretty much for a living yes. sometimes find ourselves perplexed by what Aristotle wrote. In part because it it wasn't actually composed in the same way that say, a dialogue by Plato was composed. Often with Aristotle, what you're reading is something closer to lecture notes or an outline of an argument that would have been delivered in person as part of an ongoing discussion. But like you say, let's start with the basics. Uh, this guy lives in the 4th century BC, so that's the 300s BC. And the end of his life, he dies in 322, is really kind of the end of what we think of as the classical period. So we're now after Socrates, who walked barefoot in the Agora and was executed by the state. We're sort of contemporaneous with Plato, who was Socrates' greatest student, but then Aristotle is in turn Plato's greatest student. And each of these men has obviously enormous respect for his teacher, but also 
butts heads in all these interesting ways and, and wrestles profoundly with the intellectual tradition that they're they're each a part of. And so Aristotle, one of the most famous things about his life is that he spent some time in the court of Philip of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great. And we think that he probably tutored Alexander for some pretty short period of time. But that gives you a flavor of where he is in the ongoing sort of, you know, story of history that Athens has really had its great flour flourishing and flowering. And there's been, you know, the Peloponnesian War and any number of triumphs and catastrophes. And now, in some sense, they, they say the owl of Athena flies at dusk. You're getting really one of the world's most brilliant minds at a time when, unbeknownst to the Greeks, you know, Alexander was about to sweep through the world, conquer massive territory and really transform the entire political situation forever afterward. Um, but Aristotle delivers for us in these very detailed treatises some of the most sophisticated and enduring thinking that comes out of the classical world and, and especially the high classical period in Greece. Well, though I know a limited amount about him, I recently learned more about Aristotle through a totally random segment I did on this show on the human body. Mm -hmm. As you may know, Spencer, wow. I, I love talking about random, what I call life subjects. And I did one on how the brain works. And I did another on how our eyes work. And as I was researching this, I also wanted to consider how did people before, you know, scans and autopsies and, and modern science today, how did people understand the way our body worked? And both with the brain and with the eyes, Aristotle seemed to be ahead of the game. For instance, I learned that people used to believe that our intellectual activity came from our heart instead of our brain. And it was Aristotle who kind of came in and said, wait a minute, actually, I think that we have intellectual activity in our brain. That's sort of the hub of, of common sense. Similarly, with our eyes, I talked about how people used to have this theory of extra mission, that we would literally shoot out light beams from our eyes, which would illuminate things. And it was Aristotle who raised his hand and said, wait a minute, maybe we have uh -huh. something intramission. You know, maybe we're receiving light and that's how we process an image. So at the very least, I take your point that he was one of the the greatest ever, and especially at that time in Greece, from from what I learned about his uh, his uh, very uh, prescient observations about the human body. Oh my gosh, this is so cool, and I can already tell we have so much to talk about. Yes, we do. Yes, this is one of the most amazing things about Aristotle's what you would call his corpus, his body of work. You know, in general, in the ancient world there wasn't as clear a distinction between what we would now think of as the disciplines. These days, if you go into grad school, it's like you have to narrow your focus more and more and more until you're just studying like one question in the field of the philosophy of knowledge or, or whatever. But those distinctions were nowhere near as clear cut in the ancient world. And in fact, there was much more of a sense that all knowledge was in some way interconnected. And so mm. many of the earliest philosophers were also poets and felt that they could best express their philosophy through verse. That wasn't true necessarily of Aristotle, but what was true is that he had this voracious polymathic appetite. And you get stuff still, you know, that of the works that survive, there's, of course, wide ranging treatises on ethics and how to, you know, live the good life, as you indicated. There's stuff about metaphysics and our ultimate purpose and place in the universe. But there's also stuff about, like, you know, the gills on a cuttlefish, these really <laughs> like, yes. detailed biological examinations. And as you say, he was ahead of his time on a lot of stuff. Um, the intromission theory would take hundreds and hundreds of years, and it wouldn't be until the Arabic uh, Renaissance, essentially, or the Arabic Middle Ages, that you get the great philosophers like Alhazen, who are kind of realizing that this that Aristotle was right about this. Um, it's also the case that his physics, which is a word that we get from Greek, meaning just the study of things that happen naturally or spontaneously, so sort of now what we would think of as, as science, really, was the defining framework for thinking about science all throughout the Middle Ages. And even though the scientific revolution did involve you know, questioning Aristotle and revising some of his major points, it also arose right out of the framework that Aristotle basically 
created, laid the groundwork for, and that defined the medieval academies and the first universities. So even though, you know, even if we've never read him, even if he's hard to read, Aristotle is kind of everywhere and he's just in the bones of the West in this really cool way once you get down to studying it. If you ever want to feel lazy or unaccomplished, you look at all of the polymaths yeah. from, you know, centuries and centuries uh, before. I mean, even up until very recently, we had magnificent polymaths. Benjamin Franklin, of course, being uh, a, a main one. I, I look up the accomplishments yeah. of Benjamin Franklin and how varied they were. And <laughs> I wonder what I'm doing with my life. But, you know, I think a lot of it, too, is that we, of course, right now sort of have this um, in vogue idea that, that it's right to specialize instead of mm. being versatile. But also we have so many distractions in, in modern life. We have the blessings of technology, but of course technology serve, uh, serve as immense distractions. And I think back in the time of Aristotle, the reason he was interested on the gills of a fish for mm -hmm. instance, as you yeah. said, is because you had to be interested in life. You know, th that mm -hmm. was just all that was around you. The, it was much more bare, of course, compared to what we have today. Hmm. Yes. Well, I, on one level, of course, there wasn't as much sort of there weren't as many shiny objects, as many blinking lights. And in that way, yes, the kind of data and information available was was less. But one thing that emerges as you study the ancient world is that that sort of led to a richer and deeper engagement with mm. what was there. And yes. part of the effect, the marvelous effect of going back this far in time is to find people saying things and you think, oh my gosh, you too? Like <laughs> that, they were already talking about that? You know, I mean, this is not the most exciting example, but if you think of about like in Euripides, there are these moments where Hippolytus will say, you know, why do we have to get married to have kids? Why couldn't we just produce children by, by you know, trading precious metals for them? <laughs> and it's like, wow, they all, I mean, that's kind of grotesque, but like they already had that thought. I thought that was like a disease of late stage modernity. And with <laughs> Aristotle, because so much of what we think kind of arose out of him, uh, there's, there's beautiful, you know, wonderful insights, you know, things like we become good by doing good, these kind of aphorisms that we've now kind of distilled out of his work. We don't even realize, you know, that come out of him. But yes, it was that intensity of attention to everything. You know, the famous painting of the School of Athens by Raphael in which Aristotle and Plato, the student and the disciple, are talking to one another. Um, Plato has his hand up toward the heavens because it was his great emphasis that there are eternal truths that aren't just part of you know, this or that moment, but that endure throughout all time. And Aristotle has his hands stretched over the ground because Aristotle's insistence, his emphasis was, yes, you know, there are truths, there are things that are true, but they're here, they're in the here and now, and we learn them through meticulous and careful attention to the realities around us. Um, and, and that was, in, in one sense, kind of the legacy of his life. You're absolutely right. It's it's a sort of daunting, terrifying legacy when you think about there it almost isn't a subject, even today, that you can't trace back in some way to Aristotelian. Mm. Well, let's try to outline some of the main contributions of Aristotle. You know, the random person walking down the street who doesn't know very much yeah. about Aristotle, what do they have to know about this individual and the moral advances that he made? Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the Book of Mormon. Uh, really I, I've seen it twice, actually. Amazing. Okay, so listen, love my Mormon brethren and sisteren, but that is a very funny musical. And the opening number, they're going, going door to door and, and they're bringing the Book of Mormon and mm -hmm. they're advertising it. And they have this like kind of repeated refrain, like, this book will change your life. This book will change your life. This book will change your life. And that's <laughs> how I feel about Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, that I want to like go to her and be like, this book will actually change your life. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, moral philosophy is one area where probably the most people have the most connection to Aristotle, because what he does in this realm is, is really formalize the thoughts that obviously had been a part of philosophy up 
to, to that point um, about what it is to be good at being human. Probably the most important subject that any of us can ever think about. And he profoundly sort of gets to the heart of this fundamental question that I sort of suggested earlier, which is like, is it the consequences of our actions that, that matter? Or is it the nature of our character the, or our desires and our intentions that, that matter? And always with Aristotle, what you get is this beautiful synthesis of, of sort of two truths that initially start to seem like opposed to one another. Um, but with Aristotle, you get what, what is now sort of referred to as virtue ethics, which is this notion that actually ethics, that is to say, our character, it comes from a Greek word meaning, meaning character, ethos. Um, ethos is just a matter of practice and that what we really want is to desire the things that are good in themselves. But mm. in order to desire them that way, um, we have to do them more and more. And this is one reason why we, you know, have to make kids do what's right before they can grow up to want what's right. You think about, like, even something so simple as eating healthy, right? People who are trained in youth to enjoy healthy foods, they, you know, have a much easier time of practicing those good habits as they grow older. And then you take the power of that insight, the kind of thing that, we might now call atomic habits and you apply it to something like courage, right? That you, it, you have to be trained, schooled to practice this and get it in the grooves of your soul. Um, and, and to think that this guy is, is realizing this before any of that stuff you were mentioning about like, you know, neuroscience or what we now know about habit forming pathways in the brain, you know, this was purely through rational observation and very, very careful reasoning about how people are. So that's one kind of major domain where Aristotle made huge contributions. Um, I would say another one is in this realm of, uh, I, would, I would bundle together physics and metaphysics. Mm. Um, and those are the names of two books, the physics and the metaphysics. And you could place in that category also the de anima, which, which means on the soul. Because um, this is where Aristotle really starts to ask, like, what's the world made of? And what are we in, in that world? world. And this is, you know, the sort of thing that on the one hand can get a little bit more esoteric, but on the other hand, you really have to start thinking about it in order to understand why it is that we are the sorts of things who can, the sorts of beings that can have ethics at all, right? So he says, you know, Plato has this big grand idea about the forms, the, you know, the perfect or eternal truths. Uh, and yet, we have never looked at the forms that this thing where this notion that we're going to sort of slip out of the world and commune directly with disembodied beauty or, or reality or love. Um, this, this doesn't actually happen. You can't point to it. You can't see it. Um, and always in our life, we are embodied. We are living in the world. We're making these concrete choices. Um, and this is what now gets referred to as hylomorphism, which is a very complicated philosophical word for the idea that, we are always embodied souls. We are always form in matter and everything we do and we know happens, takes place in a world where forms are made out of matter. Um, so that is like, you know, another section of his work that's kind of an amazing contribution and has major implications for how you think about physics and science even, even today. Um, I would say hylomorphism is kind of like one of, it's a very boring word for one of the most exciting ideas in, in philosophy. It's a major important influence in, uh, in Thomas Aquinas. Mm. I mean, then, of course, you've got the works on, on logic, which are often kind of placed in this bundle called the organon, um, which just means tool. And it was the set of books that were used during the Middle Ages basically to define the rules of thought, like to think about how do we make arg arguments that hold together, something that we could do really well to teach in schools now, but don't. Yes. Um, what's the nature of language and how do we communicate effectively? Um, there, you know, there are all sorts of, I mean, the, the one book that people read that uh, is it's sort of shorter and one of the minor works that has become somewhat popular is the rhetoric, right? How do we persuade people effectively, let alone how do we get at the truth effectively? Um, so there's that whole parcel of, of sort of like what's the right way to think and what's the right way to speak. Then there's the sort of more, 
you know, uh, minor stuff about the cuttlefish and the, you know, <laughs> the generation of animals and so on and so forth, which we could put into like a big bucket called like miscellaneous stuff. And um, that doesn't even cover the lost works. We have like huge wow. records of things that he wrote that didn't even survive. Things like, you know, dialogues that, that we just don't have. Um, but if I were telling somebody like, you know, you here's how you want to get to know Aristotle, I would say start with the ethics because that'll hit you where you live and then <laughs> move on to the physics and the metaphysics because that will sort of teach you why any of this makes sense. And then maybe from there, if you're really just jonesing for some more Aristotle and you want to mainline it, go to the Organon and the, you know, and, and, and sort of um, works on language and, and logic. Aristotle Roadmap brought to you by Spencer Clavin. <laughs> that's great. Go. No, I in 15 minutes or less. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I want to follow up on, on a few of those things you mentioned. And, and as you were speaking, I, I was thinking, wow, it really is true that Aristotle was a, a polymath. Uh, mm. My gosh, the, the ground that, that he seemed to, to cover. I, I want to follow up on, on the first part that you discussed with regard to virtue, because I mm. think that's, that's very important and ever relevant, especially right, right now in our country where we, we, we need to get back to, to teaching virtue. And mm -hmm. if I understood you correctly, you said that, that Aristotle essentially believed that you should act the, the way that you want to be, be mm. who you want to be. If you mm. want to be a courageous person, go out and put yourself in situations where you have to be courageous. Mm. Is that a, a fair assessment? Yeah, I like that idea very much. Yes, that's a great way of putting it. So, um, the word virtue, as we now use it, is a, is a Latin word, but it, it's basically a translation or, or it's rather it's sort of the Latin version of a Greek concept called arete. And arete just means excellence. So now when we hear virtue, we think kind of of, you know, seven rules that you if you get these wrong, you'll be a bad person, you know, and that's what we think about with ethics, too. We think about scolding people. Don't don't do this. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Um, but of course, as you as you suggest, true excellence, true virtue only begins with what you shouldn't do. It then moves directly to what you should do. And the rules for, you know, avoid that you, you don't want to be a glutton. You don't want to, <laughs> you know, be a cad or a boor or any of these things. Um, we often stop there. But really, that's just the threshold. That's just the beginning for teaching you how to do what you do want. Um, and so virtue and morality, which are often presented now as these barriers to, to happiness, because you can't have the shiny object that you that you want right in front of you, what they actually are in Aristotle's teaching is the route to the fullest possible happiness based mm. on the nature of, of the kind of being that you are, which is a rational animal, a being with a body that nevertheless is able to make rational choices and, and, and deliberate and make good decisions. Um, and so, yes, the way that we train ourselves to want and to like those good things that are good for us is to do them, that there's this kind of beautiful feedback loop which emerges. And one of Aristotle's best insights, I think maybe an underappreciated insight that he has, is about the nature of, of pleasure and things that we like. He says, you know, pleasure is just sort of what it feels like for us to recognize that something is good. Um, but in our natural state, that antenna can be kind of bent out of whack. And we might like things that are bad for us, or we might like things in the wrong way or at the wrong time. And so the process of practicing virtue, excellence, is just a process of setting that antenna back in the right direction so that you start to enjoy the things that are good and delight rightly and your pleasure which is a, a experience of goodness is directed at things that are actually really good and we all know that this happens when you build good habits if you start out by saying you know i i know that i need to go to the gym and i know that i'm supposed to <laughs> you know work out once a day or whatever um we all know that when you start with that it, it feels awful, right? It hurts. It's not actually pleasant or enjoyable. But that gradually as you get into that habit, you start to learn to like it. And the pleasure that you get out of it is so much richer than the other pleasure you were trying to get out of whatever 
you know, bag of Doritos you were eating or out of sleeping in an hour later or, or whatever. Virtue is kind of like that. It's like going to the gym and that the more you do it, the better it becomes and the greater joy it, it brings you, which is a brilliant way of, of thinking about it and, and really does, I think, belong to Aristotle. It's not short term, it's long term. That's, yes, that's, that's what right. I'm, I'm gleaning. I, I wonder mm -hmm. how Aristotle's understanding of virtue compares with Machiavelli's. I don't believe that mm -hmm. we have discussed Machiavelli together, but I loved, I, I took a um, philosophy course with Professor Harvey Mansfield in, in college, and my favorite, and he's a Machiavelli scholar, my, my favorite part of the course was when we read The Prince and Discourses on Livy. Mm -hmm. And as, as you know, and as I have done, I've done several shows on Timeless about Machiavelli, Machiavelli sort of understands virtue as perhaps accomplished when you sometimes have to subvert the virtue. And so, for instance, mm -hmm. he talks about, you know, this idea of, of being benevolent and cruel. And sometimes he mm -hmm. says, you know, if you endeavor to be fully benevolent, you actually become cruel because you, uh, you, you are so uh, forgiving, you're so um, mm -hmm. kind that you allow really bad things to happen. And I, I mm -hmm. think we're, we're seeing that right now where, you know, some people with, with good intentions are repealing, you know, cash bail laws and they're defunding the police. And many of them think that they're doing the right thing. And then we're seeing that as a result of their quote unquote benevolence, people are getting slaughtered in the streets, which is hardly benevolent. And so Machiavelli mm. postulated that you need to sort of balance the virtue and its antidote in order to accomplish the virtue. What would Aristotle mm. say to, to that idea of Machiavelli? Hmm. Well, this is a major feature of what has sometimes been called the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns, the idea that there's a kind of break between the ancient world, the classical world, and the conditions that start to obtain as, you know, the polis, the, the city state grows out into the empire. And there's, you know, uh, the discovery of the new world is, is, a, is a major part of this, too. But one way to kind of get into this question, I think, is to th ask again about the root of the different words that we're talking about here. So I mentioned that arete in Greek means means excellence, right. being good at being human. And I mentioned also that in Latin, that word becomes virtus, which is where we get our word virtue. But virtus means literally manliness, which, which arete does not mean. In, in Greek, manliness is andrea, and it means courage, one specific virtue. But in Latin, there's a very tight connection between virtue and a sort of masculine vigor and and it's not the case that you know all romans only think men can have virtue or whatever they adopt a lot of these same greek ideas but that connection is is very close in in rome in a way that maybe it isn't so much in greece and i think it's very close in machiavelli as well who was a close careful reader of livy as you know but more generally of you know roman antiquity especially i would i would say and so in Italian, virtu, which is very obviously right next to virtus and, and virtue, really, I think, is a kind of vitality, a kind of, you mm. know, willingness or energy, a drive to get done what needs getting done. And it might almost be closer in Machiavelli to the platonic idea of thumos, which is like the heart or the chest, right? Your sort of spiritedness and your ability to... To, to carry through. And you might say that for Machiavelli and as well for us, you know, when in eras where that energy is looked down upon or is curtailed or has fallen out of favor, there, that connection between sort of vitality and willingness to, care, to follow through and virtue becomes much closer because the virtues that you need to exercise are always the ones that are least favorable, least least popular. I see. And and Machiavelli, you know, had this, as as you know, you know, was was living in an era where he had a lot of criticisms, especially of the Christian Church, for sort of being too soft and for being too, um, you know, as you say, cruel in how kind it it was trying to be or how kind people were trying to be. So he would say, well, okay, but in order to accomplish virtuous ends, we sometimes need to do things that don't seem very nice or kind. 
Um, and if you wanted, as, as I sort of do, to square the circle with Aristotle, I think it's possible an Aristotelian might say, well, okay, doing things that look nice but actually bring about suffering wouldn't truly count as excellence. They would be sham excellence or the appearance mm. of excellence. And it's definitely true that this thumos, this energy, needs to be incorporated into the way that we pursue actually good ends rather than just the ends that make us look good. Um, but it's probably not the whole picture. It's probably more to do with what's going on in Machiavelli's time and in ours than with the theory of virtue full stop, which is what you get in in Aristotle. And I think that you know our, a lot of our modern philosophers get this wrong too when they go in the opposite direction and they say like, you know, Virtue is just like manly energy. A lot of kind of modern Nietzscheans will, will associate the two very closely. But I think that's a reaction to the times. I think mm. that's part of what's going on with us now, which is that manly virtue has been so terribly uh, trampled on and, and uh, scorned that now we're having to reemphasize it and, and insist upon it. Um, but that it's not the whole of what makes up virtue because, of course, you know, generosity is also part of of virtue um you know so so is justice which doesn't always involve you know punitive measures uh so is is wisdom and temperance and these things are are also i think machiavelli would agree part of what it means to truly be excellent at at being human it's just that it also sometimes involves the dirty work which is what machiavelli mm -hmm. i think is trying to emphasize we do have a few questions in the chat, and I would like to get to at least one of them uh, before we part. But before that, just quickly, I, I, I would like to ask you about Aristotle's views on logic, which, of course, you mentioned mm. in that great answer of, tell me what Aristotle is best known for and what we should know about him. You're probably thinking, please, we, we could do this in 15 Thinker of the Month episodes. Uh -huh. But uh, it was a great synopsis and, and a great uh, introduction. But you did indeed mention logic. And I know from, from your book, How to Save the West, shameless plug, mm. uh, that uh, there were, thank you. <laughs> he d he doesn't even ask me yeah. to do this. I just, I, I love the book so much. I know. I think it's I so life changing. I, I know. <laughs> yes, you should. You should Venmo me a sum of money for every shout out I give. Absolutely. I'd be quite wealthy. Uh, no, I, I do it. I do it willingly. It's, it's so, um, it's so life changing. But I, I do know from your, your book, How to Save the West, that there was a lot of sophistry going on at this time. Uh, mm. You know, and, and it's sort of a, reminded me of when you were writing about eloquent savages. Uh, there was this mm -hmm. emphasis on, on speaking very well and arguing very well, uh, even if the substance wasn't always fantastic. And of course, sometimes the substance was mm -hmm. fantastic. But, but how does Aristotle fit into that with his views on, on logic and um, oration? Well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> of course, there's so much to talk about. But it's interesting that we haven't yet even touched on what what's called the trivium, which was a way after Aristotle, a way that people gradually started to organize the basic subjects that you needed in order to start doing philosophy and learning and becoming an educated person. And trivium means three roads or three ways. So it was three subjects. It was uh, logic, it was grammar, mm. and it was rhetoric. And, and these were effectively how to think, how to talk, and how to persuade. They were like the nuts and bolts rules for how to use this apparatus. And if you think about this as like, you know, education is, is, is like learning to drive. The, the trivium is like where the instructor sits you down and says, okay, here's the gear shift, and here's the clutch, and here's the pedal, and this <laughs> does that, and these things, these are kind of like where all of the the, the tools are. And then the quadrivium, which is where you moved on next, were these four sort of larger subjects, things, you know, like geometry, which included, you know, all sorts of speculations about the, um, that, that could lead you into, you know, astronomy and the motions of the heavens and all this stuff. Um, and that was where you started to use this, this operating system, if you like, that you had been schooled in through the, the trivium. So what Aristotle does in logic, and, and this is sort of his innovation in, in many ways, is to write out the ground rules for what that operating system should 
look like. Of course, Aristotle didn't invent logic. There was already <laughs> the word logos, meaning rational thought. And there was already discussion of how you could make valid arguments and how to make invalid arguments. But one of Aristotle's major features as a thinker, for better and sometimes for worse, is that he loves systems. He really wants to organize things into a theoria, a, a theory that you can look at. And, and so we get in Aristotle many of the rules that we now rely on in order to determine whether an argument is, is sound or not, whether it's valid or not. One of the classic examples here would just be like the, the law of non-contradiction, that you, you can't say something is true and also not true at the same time. Mm. And that sounds so obvious to us until you realize that, of course, people are right now with their faces hanging out, making arguments that two plus two can equal five in some yes. ways. Or, you know, they're, I get in my book up into this whole multiverse theory, which is effectively an argument that there can be A and not A, that, that somebody can be both dead and alive in, in different universes at the same time. And so the Aristotelian framework or the operating system that we get in the, in the works on logic, it, it's, it's kind of the, there as guardrails to like teach us the rules of the game. And it's less of an end in itself than, you know, like the steps of a dance and then you move on in the dance to do astronomy and to do science and to do all the things that we think of as part of the intellectual life. Wow. Excellent. So interesting. I'm seeing in the chat, this is, this is something I was actually planning on asking Spencer myself. Did Aristotle believe in God or gods? What type of gods did he believe in an afterlife? Now you're asking the sorts of questions that get people killed. <laughs> I didn't mention that uh, yeah. Aristotle is is rumored to have fled Athens. He did leave Athens at the end of his life. And th there's a, a story, an anecdote, that he did it because, you know, as Alexander was, Alexander's empire was growing, this anti-Macedonian sentiment was was also growing in Athens. And Aristotle had been associated with the court of the Macedonians. And so he sort of felt like it was time to get the hell out of Dodge because that <laughs> they might come for him. And he's, the anecdote is that he said, I see no reason to uh, let Athens be guilty of sin against philosophy twice, meaning I don't see, see why they should have the blood of both Socrates and Aristotle on, on their hands. <laughs> and if you remember your Socrates, you remember that you know, he was killed for not believing in the gods of the city, among other things. This has to do with his crit criticisms of polytheism, that it doesn't really make sense to believe in multiple gods at, at once. And, you know, books and books have been written about what Socrates did believe about the divine. But I think a good starting place would be for Plato, for Socrates, and for Aristotle, there is absolutely a realm of what we would now call the divine. And in Greek, you will often get hotheos or hotheios, that which is godly. The tricky, the sticky point, and the part where it can be get, get difficult to nail Aristotle or anybody down is, you know, is that a personal yeah. Christian would think about the divine? Or is that a kind of abstracted realm of where we, you know, where pure ideas exist, or is it some mixture of, of the two? And the, the place where this really kind of gets to become important is in metaphysics, where he starts to talk about, you know, whether there's any part of the soul that endures after death. And he talks about this in, the, in De Anima on the Soul as, as well. I am inclined to think that Aristotle believed the, that the metaphysical was, was real, that it, he probably didn't think of it as like having thoughts in the same way that we might think about God having thoughts and intentions, mm -hmm. um, but that he did think we were able, human beings were able, consciousness, in fact, was able to uh, commune with the divine and that everything we think of as best in, in life, we think of through the part of our soul that exists in some sense outside of time. And when we exercise that faculty, we, we transcend our bodily selves and we, we enter into communion with the divine. There's another whole kettle of fish or I guess can of worms you could open about whether that means we individually dissolve into this sort of pure thought or, or whether we personally have a role to play in making up that bigger divine picture. Um, 
but I, I do think that Aristotle believed that there was a divine reality, that consciousness was essential to it, and that we had some access to it. It is not surprising that someone as brilliant as Aristotle had some kind of view of the divine, because as I often observe on, on Dennis and Julie, where we primarily discuss religion and uh, struggling with God, you know, I, I often say that believing in the divine builds in a kind of meaning in life. It, there, mm -hmm. There's built-in stakes. Whereas if you don't believe in, in any higher power or anything divine, in a way, what incentive do you have to make the most of your existence? If you just think, oh, we're a materialist bundle of cells, you know, a blip on the, the radar, radar screen of, of planet Earth, whatever. I might as well partake in worldly pleasures while I'm here since this is all it is. So it's, it's not shocking that, that someone uh, like Aristotle did have a kind of conception of an afterlife or of a, a god or gods. Yeah, you know, something I've been stressing on Young Heretics recently is one of my favorite etymological points, which is that when we say the word supernatural, the image that probably comes to mind is like, ooh, witches and ghosts and scary mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, medieval superstition. But the word supernatural is, is a Latin word. It comes from two concepts, super, which means above, and natura, which means nature. And the supernatural is just anything that is outside of this system of cause and effect that we study when we, for example, do science. And this modern idea, as you say, is, is that there is no supernature. There is nothing supernatural. But if that's true, then there's no reason to expect not only that, you know, there would be meaning in life, but just that science would work at all. Because for nature to exhibit order, it has to actually be ordered. That is, it has to be a, a whole mm. that is, is finite well and, and limited, and there has to be something beyond it. Um, and that's why the Greek version of supernatural, if you take those same roots, the above or the beyond nature, and you translate that into Greek, you get meta above and phusis nature, which is just metaphysics. So the supernatural is not some sort of irrational thing. It's a necessary part of philosophy that neither Aristotle nor any other great philosopher would want to deny needs to exist in order for us to do reasoning about other things. So yeah, absolutely. The smartest people to live have been almost universally theists of, of one form or another, because you kind of have to be once you start thinking about it. Chatting with you, Spencer, is like going to spiritual and moral Disneyland. But back when Disneyland was fun and not woke and creepy. <laughs> it's a it's it's a great, you know, taste of, of all of the the important things to consider in life. And as you write in Eloquent Savages, this is so much of our problem today where people need to, you know, face these cosmic questions about who we are, why we are here, our existence. We think about those things as kind of fluffy in the sky, pie in the sky kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm really, really uh, realizing so much how important it is and being a happy and healthy individual to face those questions. So thank you for, for helping me and all of us face them. It's, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Spencer. Anytime. I, I loved this conversation and you're, you always ask great questions, but this was a particularly fun one. It was, it certainly was. And please everybody consider ordering, pre-ordering, that is Spencer's new book called Light of the Mind, Light of the World, How New Science is Illuminating Ancient Truths About God. <laughs>